All right. And we are recording. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Generally Irritable. I'm your host, Erica Reddick. And with me today is Mr. Archie Flower from the Libertarian Party. Now, Archie, you are the chair of the Vermont Libertarian Party. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. What does that mean to be the chair of the Vermont Libertarian Party? Well, uh, I'm hoping that it means that we can build out some serious infrastructure this coming year. The, the geek inside of me loves doing research, and I've gone back and looked at historical um, data about the Vermont LP, and 30-ish towns have been actually registered in the last like decade. Um, Interesting. So uh, let's, let, let's back it up for a moment. To be a minor party in Vermont, you need to have 10 towns registered or, or coordinated, however they want to phrase it, on the Secretary of State's page. And then you form the state committee. So we're a minor party officially. And what that means is that we can run candidates on the ballot by having a committee say the candidate is on the ballot. So like the Addison County Committee put me on the ballot for state Senate um, this last time. Um, the Caledonia District Committee, I think, put JT Dodge on the ballot for state committee. So that's what that means is as a minor party, we don't have primaries, but we're still a party. We are still capable of doing party-like things and so on. Got it. So the 30 some odd towns, historically, I went back and looked at our records and towns that we don't have right now organized have been in the past. So that's my goal is to get those towns reorganized, to get those counties reorganized. And then the major party status comes with, I, I forget the particular statute, but so governor, lieutenant governor, so hold on, hold on. I'm going to interrupt you, Archie. I don't okay, yep. too far down the logistics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got into the uh, So I, But I love it. I Give a little history about the Libertarian Party that's in Vermont. That's great. What, I, what I'm really looking for is what does it mean to be a libertarian? Um, you know, I have what I believe about it. You know, a lot of people have an opinion about what it means to be libertarian. Of course, we were just talking about how Somehow we get called a uh, racist for being libertarian. My black husband has been called a racist against black people as a libertarian, which is very strange. But, you know, so the concept or the party, the idea libertarian, people don't really understand. Could you explain to people what it means to you and what you think how it represents as a party? It comes down to live and let live. It, it comes down to every person respecting the inalienable and equal rights of every other person. Now, you mean that liberty? does not, yes, that, that's, <laughs> that's the root word. <laughs> the, Sorry for interrupting, keep going. No, no, that's okay. Um, so the, the, the general idea is actually, I believe we were founded as a very libertarian nation. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I love their philosophical precision in this because they talk about the pursuit of happiness, not happiness itself. No one owes you what it takes to make you happy. Wait, 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 Archie. Hold on, hold on, hang on there. Are you telling me that I am responsible for my own happiness. Not yeah, basically. Oh my God. I In can't. In a nutshell. What? You mean I can't make you give me your stuff so that I can be happy? That would be correct. What? Well, then forget about it. No, seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, really, like, I've heard that before where libertarianism, is that a word? Liber yes is really closer to the founding principles than any of the other parties. I, I believe it is. And one of the things I like to say is that the Libertarian Party is basically the founding of this nation, plus about two centuries of lessons on how to keep government small. 
because we have not applied those lessons. Government is huge right now. We do live in an imperial state, but. Uh, yes, that's what people don't, um, you know, one of the, oh, so let me back up. Everyone, I've asked Archie to be with me today because the drug debate, um, you know, decriminalization and things like that has really taken uh, center stage in a lot of states over the last several years. We've seen marijuana become either legalized or decriminalized in, um, is it 23 states, I think, or 20? I don't know the number, but it is impressive. It's something like 20 some odd have medicinal marijuana, then a bunch of them have decriminalized it. And now you have Oregon who completely decriminalized everything. Yep, spotlights on them. Okay, so you heard about that. Yep. And so now a lot of people who know me know that I got sober 11 years ago. And now I don't hold any baggage or ill will towards anybody who is a user or any struggles with any of that stuff. So my experience, I have a couple of different frameworks for having this conversation. One is I'm a recovering addict. And so I have a certain kind of opinion about things. But also, I'm very libertarian. And so I don't believe that my choices for myself should affect the people around me. And so what I really wanted was a libertarian who could, who could do a good job of explaining what it means, what libertarian means, how it relates to the drug war. And Archie, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions some of which are going to sound adversarial and I totally don't mean it to be. I'm going to ask you the questions that I've heard opponents of legaliz of legalization say, and I'm going to ask you some of those questions because I really want people to have, I have no opinion on this topic. I, I kind of do, but I don't. So let's all flesh it out together. That's what we're looking for today. Absolutely. And that's because like we were talking about before we started rolling the camera, you know, I really was disappointed that Trump was not included in the presidential debates. I'm sure you my metric is simple. If you're on enough ballots to theoretically win the Electoral College, you should be in the damn debates. Or at least invited. I, I that sounds like a that sounds reasonable. Do we even what are the rules even to be included? So the Commission on Presidential Debates is formed by the Republican and Democrat parties. So they set the rules. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes. That's so chintzy. Yes. Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh my God. It's, it's not a public thing. It's, it's made by the parties. Okay. It's made, it's made by okay. the duopoly. Duopoly? Yep. Oh, that's good. Is that a real word? It is in libertarian circles. We use it we all like the time. It. Duopoly. Remember, write that down. Um, that is really funny. So, okay. So I was listening to something today about, now your argument that you said to me, what I said, I want to talk about legalizing drugs and like the libertarian viewpoint. And I said, you know, can you share with me this information? And you said, you can talk well about how it's an assault on the Bill of Rights. Yep. Okay. So why don't we start there, right? If okay. We're talking about if we're talking about the foundation <clears throat> of the country, you know, and our and the United States is liberty, uh, libertarian party, liberty founding. How, in your view, or the libertarian view, does drugs being illegal how, how is that an assault on the Bill of Rights? Actually, that's a perfect segue to explain why I'm a libertarian to begin with. All right. 1996 or seven, something like that. I was reading a newspaper. The article was about some man that the Vermont State Police put a camera on his property and they saw, so, so they saw marijuana on his property they put a video camera on the property to find out who was tending the plants and they caught the guy what's the is problem with this 
what's the problem with this? They did it without a warrant. That's what I was like, is that even legal? Exactly. And what makes this story worse is the Vermont Supreme Court upheld this man's conviction. Yep. Second. So, so, so the police saw, was it on private property? I believe it was. So they saw on private property, somebody had some weed and they went on to said private property and installed camera. Yep. On person's private property. Without a warrant. Isn't that, wait, wait, 96, that was before the Patriot Act. Yep. So, which this was, this was long, long ago in a galaxy far, far wait, away. I don't even have, wait, that's what I'm saying. Like, how can you spy on um, so, citizens? So, being outraged, kind of like you are now, I started okay. studying the Bill of Rights. <laughs> I started studying the Constitution. And that led me down the path towards finding libertarianism. I found authors like Claire Wolf and Del Neal Smith and Vince Prenowitz and Ayn Rand and a whole plethora of other people and influences. And at first, probably for three to four years, I considered myself just a, a constitutionalist. Um, I didn't, I, I wasn't politically aware enough to find a party or be a member of a party or anything like that. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I only joined a party in 2016, and that was the LP. Um, Nicholas Sarwark was on stage at the National Convention. I wasn't there. I was watching it live. Yeah. And he said something to the effect of, if you don't join, you can't make a difference. And I'm like, yeah, I can't fault that logic. <laughs> we, we need people to start making a difference. And so, yeah, I, I, before that, I wasn't a joiner. You know, like many libertarians, I'm kind of a loner in that sense. And it's like, you know what? Okay, I get it. Do we you? have to reverse this tendency though. This is this is literally I've literally said this part of the problem with conservatives generally small c umbrella conservatives, right? Which I put libertarians under is we're all like live and let live. You do you. I'm a do me. We'll just be over here and 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 we can agree to disagree and so it's fine. And so I think that affects our ability to like set aside some of our differences and come together to fight against the push. Yeah, yeah the board um, do I'm, it very well. Okay, finish please. So, so you joined. So that's why I, I joined was because of the fourth amendment being violated like that. Um, that's what started me on my studies. And if you take any amendment, you're gonna basically see some kind of violation from the war on drugs. The, the war on drugs has empowered the state. It has created basically a police state where the police are the standing army that the founders warned us of. I'm not, let me, let me say it this way. Mm. I'm not anti-police. Yeah. I, I, I'm gonna throw a term at you you may have never heard. Um, many in the Libertarian Party consider themselves anarchists. I consider myself what is called a minarchist, minimal government. I don't, I don't go with the no government route because I want juries. I want, you know, if, if someone is, is accused of committing a crime, I want juries. And juries are an institutional form of governing, period. Every time someone tries to convince me otherwise, they end up with a mess of cognitive dissonance. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks for trying. Well, and that's what the point is. So we still need a mechanism to deal with people who violate our rights. Yes, I'm. So I'm not anti-police. I just think that the current institutions we've built up are way out of control. They are hyper militarized against us. I mean, they have access to all kinds of toys that civilians aren't allowed. Um, literally, there's a, a DOD website about excess military equipment being sold to domestic police. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a huge problem. And I'm just going to say it this way. Mm -hmm. 
speaking of the war on drugs and libertarianism and current events, had the LP been listened to back when we said, hey, let's not do the war on drugs, folks, Breonna Taylor would still be alive. Oh, that's or at least, about. or at least in this counterfactual, she wouldn't be killed by the same, you know, mechanism. I mean, I can't say that in every possible multiverse she'd be alive if the LP had been adhered to. But in terms of, you know, within the logic of the counterfactual, there'd be no reason she'd be murdered the way she was. Well, and so, so the big thing is, you know, when we take a step back. Right. So I think pretty much anybody can agree that drug addiction is not good. Okay. Yeah, you're totally. a an addict, you're a cocaine addict, you're a whatever addict. There's a good chance your life is pretty bad. Yep. Things are not good. And so what is the... Let me back. I'm trying. Let me back up a second. So, what is so the main argument of libertarian of the libertarian party say for decriminalizing drugs is that I'm I'm me and I can do whatever I want because I'm the only person I affect. Is that the gist of it? No. Right. We we don't say we're the only people we affect. Um, we absolutely recognize uh, externalities. So let's say you have, you know, you, you build a factory and you start polluting, okay? Yeah. You're, you're putting crap into the atmosphere that other people are gonna have to deal with. That's an externality. Um, in terms of social externalities, such as a drug, a drug addict, they are going into people's houses, they are stealing, you know, they're being violent, that sort of thing. Those things are not defensible. And it, it really irritates me that too many people within this debate can't see that, okay, let's take alcohol for a moment. Um, we, we, as a country, experimented with prohibition. Yes. And now it's over. And yes. we still have alcoholics. Okay. And 84,000 people die, die a year from and, and we have people that um, have fine relationships with alcohol. Some people are, are able to drink and be fine. So if you're able to drink and be fine, you aren't affecting someone else. But if you're an alcoholic and you get behind the wheel while drunk, a lot of libertarians say, period, no victim, no crime. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you get behind the wheel drunk, you should be fine, blah, blah, blah. You, you shouldn't be there. They're against any form of policing that I'm not. Here's why you are driving a 3000 pound steel missile and it could easily harm someone because you're not capable of making safely navigating the thing. Right. It would be as if someone unholsters their handgun and w puts their trigger in the finger guard, in the trigger guard, um, and waves it through a crowd. <laughs> well, uh, no victim, no crime. I didn't shoot anybody. You are directly threatening their life. It, if, if, if you believe, as a libertarian, I tell them, that you could use physical force to stop someone from doing that, then you should believe as a libertarian that you can use physical force from stopping someone from drunk driving. Well, and so that's, this, that's the line is, and that's, are you endangering someone? And that's one of the things that it has been so sort of off putting to me personally about some, the libertarian argument. And let me be straight. Okay. This has nothing to do with like libertarian, Republican, Democrat. People do a terrible job justifying what they believe just generally. A lot of people will just, you know, I believe whatever I believe and I, because I was told and I'm just going to go along with it and I can't rationalize or explain it. Um, so this is not a cut on libertarians by any means. People in general are terrible at this. No, I, I, I agree. Yeah. 
but it's one of those like people who, so I'm a Christian. And so there are people who are Christian and will argue that, well, because the Bible says so. And it's like, dude, um, unless, first of all, unless the person is a Christian, the Bible is not an authority. And so using that as an authority is stupid and they're not going to listen to you. And B, if you can't rationalize your argument with something other than the Bible, then you need to go back and look at what your argument is and why you believe what you believe. Because there, it doesn't need to be because the Bible said so. It's usually, if you dig into it, there's a reason that the Bible says so. It's because it's for maximum human flourishing. You know what I mean? Like, so libertarian, I rock with, but don't say things like, oh, well, drug addicts don't hurt anybody, so it should be fine. I'm like, that is literally stupid. You can't say that. So, so if we know that drug addiction and um, drug sales and stuff like that are harmful and can create harm, how does that, how does that like reconcile with the do no harm principle? Wait, what is it called? I got that wrong. Non-aggression principle. Non-aggression principle. So, oh, okay. So then if we, so if we know that it can cause harm and people hurt each other, then why wouldn't we just automatically make it illegal? Okay, let's pretend I have some rum in this coffee. Yes. Which doesn't have to be pretend if we took a moment to break, but I'm not gonna pour rum in my coffee. If I take a sip and just sit here for the rest of the day, I'm not harming anybody. I'm so harmed. I'm so harmed, Archie. No. Not really, no. So not only do I sense the sarcasm in your tone of voice, but you were rolling your eyes when you said that. Now, if on the other hand, I do get sloshed and go to my car and drive to the store for some Twinkies, I'm putting people in, in directly in harm's way. And I don't know who I'm, it's, it's a general type of harm. And it could be a five-year-old kid playing ball by the side of the street. It could be an 80-year-old grandmother going to see their, you know, grandchild be born. It could be, it could be anybody. It could be somebody's building. I've, I've seen people drive. Yeah, well, yeah. Somebody's it house. Be, it could be mere property damage as well. Um, right. Absolutely. So, so the idea is uh, that as long as you're not committing a crime in conjunction with the drug use, is that the idea? Is that the difference? Basically, yeah. Okay. The drug use itself is not a crime. The potential after effects could lead to crime. But the biggest thing I think that leads to crime is that it's a black market, is that we put violence into that system by keeping it illegal. And let's say you're a drug dealer and you have product directly on you and a, a 10 year old comes up, they have a the lot of cash, they wanna buy from you it's no more a felony to sell to them than to sell to someone over 18, is it? They, they're, they're gonna get busted regardless of who they sell to, so they may as well sell to that 10 year old, shouldn't they? Think about it that way. Is that for by, real? By keeping it black market, we are incentivizing drug dealers to sell to whoever has the cash. That's we can't. We cannot protect our children by making it black market. That's well, one of the biggest reasons. Is there no, should, there's no like endanger, wouldn't you get like a second charge or something for endangerment? Of there, there may be secondary charges, but the realistic prosecutor, 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 the real record of prosecutors charging these crimes <laughs> is that uh, they're mainly going to plead down to get someone higher up on the food chain. Right. It's so like that kid, that kid that's buying the meth from this dealer, hypothetically, the prosecutor doesn't really care about them, do they? They're using that dealer, dealer to get to someone higher. And they're yeah. only going after that higher dealer 
because they're trying to advance their career. They're, they're not, the whole, the whole war on drugs is corrosive to law enforcement. It's corrosive to courts. It's corrosive to the Bill of Rights, the whole system. And it breaks down, it's, it's a huge wedge between civilians and police. Mm. On, on the civilian side of things, you don't want to get caught with drugs, so you're not going to help the police find violent people. If, if you have drugs on you, you're not going to go to the police and say, yeah, this person was violent because of a drug sale. Yeah. Well, who were they selling drugs to? Me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and I... On the other I've, side... I've heard you know, stories of police officers talk about, uh, or ER staff, emergency room staff, talk about how, you know, uh, people will just dump a person who's overdosed on heroin or something. They'll just dump them out of the car in front of the ER, uh, ER yeah. and yep. run away. Yep. Or people won't call the police and call for help because the person has died or sick or, you know, made themselves hurt themselves yep. and they don't want to get busted for the drugs. So they do nothing. And then you have, and then you just hear all of these stories of people like panicking and of course they're on drugs. So they're making terrible decisions anyway and making it worse by trying to get away with whatever it is that they've done basically like because they're too afraid to get caught for doing drugs your friend dies of a drug overdose because they can't go to the hospital right exactly and stuff like that so it makes me wonder one of the things that i've often said so i've actually said for many many years that i think all drugs should be legalized because I believe that it, when you, when you create a black market, you're always going to have problems. You can't control it. You've now given it over to crime syndicates. Um, you have no transparency around it. Um, you have shame, you have guilt, you have all of these things that make it so that people won't get help. They won't see guidance and you create problems where there were none. And yes. I've heard actually that the, and I, I don't have, I don't, maybe you know better. I've heard that uh, the mob basically, what's the right word? Uh, organized crime, basically the mob was created out of prohibition of alcohol. Pretty much. Do you yeah. know, if this, can you share a little bit about that? Do you know? I, I'm not a historian. I really wish I were because <laughs> history is a fascinating topic with all kinds of lessons for us if we were to really pay attention. Yeah. But the general gist of it is when you create a black market, you are providing a direct pipeline of cash to whichever person is going to be the most violent within that market. Ooh, say that again, Archie. When you create a black market, you're creating a direct pipeline of massive amounts of cash directly to the person who is willing to be the most violent within that market. Because that's what's rewarded. Exactly. If, if you are the person to establish warlord-like control over a market, that's every rewarded. single drug user within that area is a cash cow for you. Have you watched Breaking Bad out of curiosity? Are you a fan? <laughs> I haven't. I don't, <laughs> my husband will tell you anything like, you know, oh, orange is the new black is so funny. Ha ha. I'm like, if you'd ever been to prison, you wouldn't think it was funny. <laughs> like watching I thought movies. It was funny, <laughs> ma funny mainly because um, Kate Mulgrew uh, starred as Janeway and she's my favorite Star Trek captain. <laughs> And she was in. She was in that as some Russian. She was a good captain, wasn't she? She was the best captain she was because she captain. was the most scientific. I'm not. I'm partial to the original series. Okay, that's what I grew up on. So I'm partial to that. Absolutely. But series as well. Which one was that? Oh my God, my brain's broken. Voyager. Yes, Voyager. Star Trek Voyager. Guys, you're listening to two Star Trek nerds <laughs> um, talk about decriminalizing drugs in the Libertarian Party. Um, 
so so what you were saying if you asked if i'd watch breaking bad you were gonna yep well just in terms of uh, how much cash they end up with at the end of the show got it no. So this this is one of the things that, like, as an example, my nephew is a Border Patrol agent in South Texas. And so prior to the Trump administration, um, you know, he would tell us stories about, oh, well, you know, they built, okay, yeah, so there's this section of the wall, but all they do is put a ladder up to it, or they dig a hole underneath it. Like, they've found tunnels and all kinds of stuff, and the way that they... Um, let me throw up, excuse me. The the way that they um, pack human beings with drugs to bring them across to do stuff. And then you, you see all of these awful, disgusting things that the drug cartels are willing to do. You see the number of people that they murder and slaughter at the border. I mean, my nephews told me stories where like people will be at the border getting ready to cross to go to school because if people don't realize especially on the Texas border, it's, you know, it goes across towns. So you have kids on either side of Mexico or the United States or going to school at the same school, people working across and stuff like that. And so there's usually like a gate to get through. And so there'll be hundreds of people just standing there waiting to cross the border to go to school or work. And the drug cartels will come by and just mow them all down. Kill them all. Innocent people just going to work in school. And I wonder, really, will that go away if we decriminalize drugs here? Because we have, we have such a market for it in the United States. I was going to go down the mental health. We'll wait and hold that off. But we have such a market here for drugs. If we decriminalized everything tomorrow... Do you think we'd see the cartels go away? Do you think we'd see some of this stuff get better? We would see the violence drop. The cartels would have to adapt to the new um, open market uh, model rather than the black market violence model. So violence dropping would be an economic inevitability. Because you think when you, so? Yes, when you when you incentivize violence by keeping it a black market, you're gonna get more violence. When you open up that market and take away, if, if, if you're a drug dealer and you can make more profit by not being violent, which you can be in a open market, that's the route you're gonna go. But can, but this is, so this is the question, can you be though? Because you're still competing and now you may even have more competitors for your product. We don't see the CEO of Anheuser-Busch whacking the CEO of Budweiser, do we? <laughs> Back during prohibition, alcohol had the same incentives. Selling alcohol had the same incentives as selling meth does right now. Mm -hmm. And you had mafiosos whacking other mafiosos on a That's regular true. basis. And, and I'll put a hit out on this guy because he's my direct competition and I want to make more money. That well, doesn't one, happen with alcohol these days. One of the things I heard was that uh, the government actually was like poisoning alcohol. And so yeah. you we're having people make, you know, bathtub gin or whatever. And you didn't know what was in it. You didn't know the strength. You didn't know whatever. And then the government poisoned it at one point. So it killed a bunch of people because they were trying to make it so people wouldn't drink it. And it's like. I think that's with wood alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the arguments I think um, people make about, or I heard about the legalization of marijuana in Vermont was, oh, well, we'll be able to regulate it. And I've heard this libertarian argument, you know, uh, oh, they said it like it was a, like a theme, you know, regulate, you know, you know, you know what the strength is, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that somehow that's better. We've lost some good people due to drugs being contaminated. Um, Jerry Garcia comes to mind. But is that really, 
is that really a good way of looking at it though like there's so as with most complex topics there are a myriad of different facets to it and that's only one part of the argument yeah for me the primary part of the argument is lessening the violence mm. well and not so here's what so then that's so there's another question right some of the arguments I've heard for decriminalization sound a lot like people just trying to make up excuses to make it okay. Like, oh, well, we can regulate it and we can then know how strong it is. And it's like, I feel like you're just saying that to try to placate the people who don't want you to decriminalize it. And I'm not saying it's, it's like people who say, well, we should be able to keep our guns because we go hunting. And it's like, no, the second amendment is not about hunting. The Second Amendment is about us being able to protect ourselves from each other and a tyrannical government. So you're using an argument that doesn't even make sense. Why don't you just argue what reality is, which is the Second Amendment says specifically that it's to protect ourselves against each other and a tyrannical government. So the, so the government trying to take away my Second Amendment rights tells me that it was there for a reason and it's exactly this moment and reason that we're standing in right now because you're trying to take it away from me. So why don't libertarians just argue what you said earlier, which is it's against the Bill of Rights? Is that too simple an argument? <laughs> I feel like we have to make excuses? I think that it depends on the particular libertarian how well versed they are with the thing yeah uh, each topic i mean you can take almost any topic and you can study it for a lifetime i mean it, it it's a phenomenal amount of information to have to deal with so yeah. it depends on how long they've been a libertarian how well they've studied up on the issues and here's the thing who's their particular audience in that particular moment. Because one argument that may win against, you know, a, a more right-focused audience um, may fail against a left-focused audience and vice versa. Yep. Or an independent audience or a non-voting audience or, you know, typical American demographic, wide, wide spectrum audience. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's, if you're arguing a particular point and you've got right people, right, right, right word leaning people, left word leaning people, independents and non-voters all in the same audience, you can't choose the same argument that you would if you were focusing on any particular. I mean, so section. I hear we now now. So I hear what you're saying, Archie, and I've just come off the campaign campaign trail with you. So we know we have to tailor our messaging. Absolutely. But I wonder how much of a disservice we do when we don't argue the, the basics. You know what I mean? Like when we don't, when we try to make it. Hmm. Was it Thoreau? Maybe I want to say it was Thoreau. It may not have been Thoreau. I could be totally misremembering this, but the basic gist of the quote uh, to paraphrase, for every hundred people striking at the tree, only one person is striking at the root. <laughs> and, and a lot of people will focus on the leaves rather than the roots. And the tree of tyranny has grown some very deep roots, hasn't oh, it? Isn't that the truth? This is... Uh... For anybody who's watching, oops, wait. Ah, yes. So, you know, it's one of the things that uh, my husband is so sweet. He got this for me for Christmas. Um, Did he get the Anti-Federalist Papers for you as well? What's that? Did he also get you the Anti-Federalist Papers? No. That's the other side of the argument. You should definitely pick those up. Write that down. On, wait, on pen. Okay, I will do that. But it's one of the things that, you know, we were talking earlier about how people, uh, certain kinds of people 
will manipulate the definition of words so that they can, yeah. um, you know, justify whatever wrong it is that they're unconstitutional thing it is that they're doing, you know, like, oh, well, when they said well regulated the militia, they meant the army. And it's like, no, they didn't. It meant people who knew how to shoot guns and protect themselves from your s silly face. And um, I was about to say your audio cut out there, but obviously, it didn't. <laughs> no, I saw myself from you swearing. Paused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, we don't have to ask. Well, this isn't live. You can bleep it out in post production. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but you know, we don't have to, we don't have to wonder what the founding fathers thought when they wrote the declaration of independence and the bill of rights. It's all right here. They explain themselves. They say yep. it's like, there's, we don't have to redefine words. We don't have to philosophize or think about it. They told now, them, now, Erica, are you saying you're an, an originalist? Yes. Yeah. So here's the beauty of that. Going back to um social media how did they phrase it someone on the left now i'm not saying i'm for or against trump's latest supreme court pick amy coney barrett coney, coney barrett thank you yeah i haven't studied anything really about her so i'm not gonna have an opinion because i don't know her what i do have an opinion on is originalism and i've seen people on social media say Oh, so you want to go back to treating people of color as three fifths of a person? And it's like, that's not what originalism means. <laughs> also, that's not what three fifths of a per. It was not saying that they're not a whole human being. That's a well, that's that's a whole other keep debate. Going. Keep going. That's a keep whole going. other debate. I'll wait. And a whole other, you know, rabbit hole to go down or not yep. go down. No, nope, we'll go. Be. All we'll I'm go. saying is that originalism simply means looking at what we currently have as amended and going back to the original authors of each piece and trying to figure out what they were intending for that particular piece. So what did the founders intend for the second amendment? That's originalism. And what yes. their intention was, was really, really clear. You cannot disarm the American people, period. No ifs, no caveats, no buts, no questions, no nothing. The American people can have their weapons. And that needs to be what I call infantry parity, which means if, if, a, if a military infantryman can have it, parody. then have it. an American civilian can have it. Yep. And it's, it's that simple. Okay, I was just gonna go off on the Second Amendment thing. I'm gonna try to stay on topic here. <laughs> I might have to have you back for a Second Amendment. But it is, but it is uh, on topic in the sense that the war on drugs is the war on the Bill of Rights, and that includes the Second Amendment. Well, and this is the thing: is is what I have noticed about many of the laws and programs that we see in government today, not previously, not textualism like what it was supposed to be but what we currently do today in our legislature and the rules that are set forth by our unelected fourth branch of government um, are things to help lessen the consequences of personal decision making did you track with me there so it seems like to me most of the rules now being put in place or the laws being put in place are to prevent me from suffering the consequences of my own decision making. Yeah, cradle to grave care by the government. Absolutely. Correct. It's that's, it's that's it's as if they believe they understand better how to live my life than I do. Yep, it's completely anti-individualism. Which is the basis kind of I would say for our bill of rights and the constitution. It's personal responsibility, I am free to rise and fall on my own merits. Yep. Free of yep. government interference and intrusion. Yep. And then people will say things like, well, but it's not like that. People get in the way and all these things and whatever. And it's like, okay, well, and then we have the law. 
we have a mechanism for when you invade my rights or when I invade your rights. It's called a court of law. It's called judges and lawyers and things like that. I'm innocent until proven guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty. And we have a process for working that out. Does that mean everyone is treated fairly all of the time? No, obviously, because people are trash. But isn't it more important to try to set up the most possible, the fairest, most possible system rather than forcing everybody to behave a certain way? So as a libertarian, I am all about consent. And you can have economic Edward. consent, which is a free market. And you can have social consent, which is a free market of ideas. And if you centralization and decentralization are, are, are antipodes and you have are what? a government opposites, antipodes. Okay. So you have a government trying to centralize things more and more and more and more. And it's not just, okay, have you heard the phrase politics is downstream of culture? Yes. Okay. So Basically, I think like laws and rules are created once culture has changed its mind and shifted. Yeah. So I, I think this goes back to your point about this is more than just government doing this. Government really is kind of following our general culture at the moment, which is why we need to as libertarians and freedom-minded individuals, we need to not just be fighting government and government encroachment. We need to be defending individualism at every opportunity we get. And educating people. Yes, that's, 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 that's the best defense, is educating our fellow Americans as to what we inherited from the founders. Right. And so, Centralization in social affairs or the free market of ideas leads to kind of a puritanical society, a, a rigid society of, you know, robotic like people, Borg like people that you don't get to choose your own life because of that. You don't mm. get to be the individual that you want to be because of that. You know, we see that in so many various dystopias that, you know, George Orwell didn't create a blueprint. He, he, he wrote that as a warning. Yeah. Not, not, not an architectural blueprint for the American government. Um, so that's the key point to keep in mind is, is not what are our goals as a society? How do we reach them? Libertarians say, let's use consent. Let's use voluntary methods. Let's use education. Let's minimize violence. Violence but, but should Archie, only be used in defense of rights. But Archie, people are too stupid to think for themselves and we, and they'll make bad decisions and be stupid. And so therefore we have to protect them. The libertarian counter to that is that these people that are saying people are too stupid are often promoting democracy. So if they're too stupid to run their own lives, how are they, how are they smart enough to pick people to run their lives for them? <laughs> I don't think people are too stupid to run their own lives. I think people are <laughs> capable of running their own life if they're given, you know, the tools to do so. I'm sorry. That, oh. That's one big reason I'm for separation of school and state. Ooh, say more about that. Are you a Pink Floyd fan? No. Okay. Because the song um, where they go, we don't need no education. We oh, don't yeah, need yeah. No, we don't need no thought control. Well, that's what schools are these days is, is indoctrination centers. They're not designed to actually educate kids so that kids can actually think and reason for themselves. They are designed so that we have essentially worker drones that yeah. don't think. Well, and, and they're told what they are and are not allowed to think. Yes. With, um, You're familiar with the Overton window? Yeah. Yeah, that's precisely, that comes from well, why not, that hold on, type why don't of indoctrination. You, 
Tell, tell, um, tell the audience what the Overton window is. The Overton window comes from the idea that public discourse has a very narrow range of allowed opinion. And when someone goes outside of allowed opinion, the, the whole tone of a debate can change. Um, I'm not going to dive into any particular conspiracy theory, but if you look at a anything on social media that has anything that looks like a conspiracy theory, you can see the very same rhetorical patterns played out every single time. And those patterns are like, well, that's a conspiracy theory, therefore you're an idiot. You know, it, it's, it's always some kind of straw man. It's always some in kind order of, to dismiss. It's always some kind of logical fallacy. It's always some kind of rhetorical method to keep their brains on track. It goes right back to 1984 and thought crime, where if, 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 because people have, a lot of people have been programmed to stay within that Overton window, and that's kind of what it refers to. And if they think a thought that's outside it, they have mechanisms built in to rein that thought back in and, and reject it, yep. pull out of hand, you know. Well, and you see that a lot, especially this year with a lot of the conversations about race and uh, racism in this country and stuff like that. It's, you know, my black husband has been called a racist because yeah. he wants to be left alone by the government to rise and fall on his own merits. Mm -hmm meritocracy you're a racist because you because they assume that black people they infantilize black people as if black people are unable to take care of themselves make good decisions and rise to the top and it's like you're you in order to assume what you're saying is true the assumptions are racist yeah, and then I have to disregard all the successful black people I've ever seen, met, or heard. Like, you are trying to force me to believe that black people are incapable. And I won't do that. I'm not going to do that with you. And, you know, I got called a racist. My husband got called a racist. They said he internalized his, the white supremacy. And so, so the, the thing about that, that whole conversation it follows many of the same rhetorical patterns because it's still the Overton window. And Correct. here I am on Twitter the other day saying basically racism is completely antithetical to libertarianism and here's why. And I gave my direct breakdown of the non-aggression principle. And then within that thread and sub threads, a whole lot of people started calling me racist or implying it. And it's like, Really? Uh, come on. Look at the start of where we started this thread. You know, look at what I said here. I'm obviously saying racists aren't libertarian. So am I saying I'm not libertarian because yeah, of this? It's because I, you won't. I mean, no, Archie, the problem is you won't acknowledge that you're a racist and that's why you're a racist. So everybody's racist. There, yeah, and you denying that. your racism makes you a racist. There's, there's that meme too, that, well, that's, that's, you know, if, if, uh, if the witch floats, she's a witch. If she sinks, she's not. It's, it's exactly the same kind of unfalsifiable yes. logic. Yes. Oh, she drowned. She wasn't a witch. Oh my God. Um, what is, talk to, um, would you share with our listeners, Archie, and just, just to reiterate, hey, everybody, generally irritable here. My guest today is Archie Flower. He is the Libertarian Party Chair in the state of Vermont. Uh, he ran for state senate this year in Addison County, right? That's right. Yes. And, um, just generally cool guy, has a lot of knowledge about the Libertarian Party, and I've had a lot of really fun conversations and listening to him talk over the years, which is why I wanted to have him on the show. Um, talk, tell everybody a little bit about what the non-aggression principle is. I, I will do that, but I do want to backtrack for one moment and just say, yeah. I meant to say this earlier, I love the name of this podcast, Generally Irritable. Um, I, have, I have said before that I am the animal hospital for pet peeves, <laughs> so I totally get the, 
irritability with today's politics because it's a mess. So the non-aggression principle yeah. breaks down to this simple phrase. This is how I define it. Uh, the Libertarian Party doesn't officially, nationally, it doesn't officially define it. Um, however, the Vermont Libertarian Party did pass a statement of principles last November, and we do officially define it in that. And that is simply this. It is immoral to initiate force or fraud against a non-consenting person. Oh, say that again. It is immoral to initiate force or fraud against a non-consenting person. Okay. I mean, isn't that like obvious? One would think so. I'm like, does that have to be stated? Is that a dumb? Yes, it does have to be stated. If you've seen some of the conversations I've had, <laughs> you would know that this is not a obvious truth. This is not as self-evident as some people might want to think it is. Well, and isn't that, I mean, I feel like what you just did was summarize the initial Bill of Rights. Kind of. So here's the thing. In my study of the Bill of Rights and rights in general, I think I can narrow it down to two very broad um, scope rights. Simply self-ownership, self-autonomy mm -hmm. and the right of reciprocal non-aggression so if i don't force my way on you you don't force your way on me but if i initiate force you have every right to draw your pistol or rifle or whatever's handy and make me stop with all due necessary force and that's the right to life yeah, well, that, that comes from self-ownership, self-autonomy. That, that's, right. yeah. What is, you know, I heard, who was it? I heard, a, uh, oh, not Larry Elder. It's another Larry. No, Walter, Walter Williams, I heard talk okay. about the, the idea of self-ownership. And, you know, that I I own myself. I am in charge of my own decisions my own labor i make all of the decisions for myself you know whatever and it seems like that is really the foundational basis for liberty yep it's like i am responsible for me is that basically what that means i would agree yeah you said yeah and then when you say self autonomy what exactly do you mean by that? Well, that, that's, that's just self-ownership restated in different words. Okay, so basically, I, I, I am responsible for me. This is my body. You don't have any rights to it. It's me. Sucks. Bug off. So, at, well, let me ask you this. Circling back around to the government control of drug industry, now, my understanding is you could even buy heroin over the counter up until like the 50s or 60s or some opiate. There was some version of all of these things available pretty much over the counter. Do we yep. know why? I mean, I remember, I remember talking to one of my neighbors. He was a, a truck driver and he said he used to get speed basically over the counter to drive trucks. And I find it fascinating that these things used to be easier to get. Do we know why or what happened to start the war on drugs or for these things to be made illegal? Class one drugs or anything like that? So this goes back to history and therefore is not my strong suit. However, I gotta look it up. I will say this, the war on drugs empowers government. Mm. Government seeks power mm. so just from those alone you can see that there's going to be a preponderance of of laws that hand government more power i mean it's 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 like a kid with the cookie jar with so, the lid off okay so then where does now this is this is not erica art this is the argument right so sure. where then does the government 
ever an appropriate role for government to protect us from ourselves? That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure anyone has ever actually asked me that particular question. Because <laughs> that's what it comes down to, right? Is, you know, earlier we were talking about how so many of our laws and rules that are being passed are about protecting us from our own decisions, right? So is ever an appropriate role of government in keeping us safe from ourselves? If there is such a role, it would be very narrow in scope and it would be very, it, it would have to be like something like euthanasia. Uh, you know, if, if, if you are racked in extreme pain, government's role is simply to make sure that the choice you're making is actually your choice. If, if a doctor says, yeah, I'm going to give you, you know, these drugs to, you know, fall asleep forever. Government's proper role is simply making sure that your choice is actually that the doctor isn't violating your consent, right? That the doctor isn't making some kind of use of of you for their own purposes, and is actually abiding by. Yep, that's my choice. I'm in. I'm in pain. I'm never going to not be in pain. I but don't want to live like this. So, but even that now, that's not protecting us from ourselves. That's protecting us from predator predators, and we already have lost. Well, it kind of is protecting us from ourselves because it's really just, you know, making sure that the decision really is ours. Ours. Rather than, rather than. Um, Being victimized by somebody we can, else. We can make decisions that aren't really what we would normally decide if we're under duress, you know, that kind of thing. Like right. a government can, can. Uh, well, with, and again, within, see now within technically. Within libertarian theory, a government can certainly void a contract that was signed by both parties if it finds that the contract was made under duress. But even that, again, that's, now that is protect, well, I guess that could be both. That could either be protecting us from other people or protecting us from ourselves if we don't have the ability to make a good decision, I guess. I mean, from, from the point of view of if okay, you're actually sense. of sound mind, then the right. government has no role as far as I can tell, in protecting us from ourselves. Got it. Okay. So, okay. So there's, we found a line, we found a gray area. That's what I was curious about. Because one of the things I found is a lot of times the horrible stuff that we see in our past has come from government interference. So when you talk about like the Jim Crow laws, you talk about slavery, you talk about a lot of the things, redlining, things like that, that was the government. Yep. Helping to assist in prejudice. Um, now we're talking about the war on drugs. That's the government deciding that it's going to seize control over this industry. Because is it? I mean, that's basically what it is, right? They've nationalized the drug trade. Yeah. And, oh, that's weird. I never thought about it that way. So the government... And so let, I think I'm going to restate something that you've already said, which is basically that the government nationalized the drug trade, right? So now all these drugs are class one, uh, class A drugs that you can't get unless you get permission, blah, 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 right? They've nationalized the drug industry and they just call it pharmaceuticals now instead of <laughs> dope or whatever. Exactly. That goes back to the Overton window and how someone styles their rhetoric. So, wow, okay. The pharmaceutical industry sells stuff in the open market. The illicit drug trade sells dope to addicts. That is so fascinating. But we see so many addicts of over-the-counter drugs that you're really cloaking that reality with those words, which is a whole lot of what happens in our society these days. Especially because, so this is, so this is one of the things <clears throat> I, I heard these statistics, something like 60,000 people die every year of drug overdoses, 
80 some odd thousand die of alcohol. Who knows how many people die of cigarettes uh, and secondhand smoke and stuff like that. Um, I don't know that number. Somebody can share, put it in the comments. Google knows it. But that's, so it's not even about who dies or the volume of people harmed, it seems like. It's like, what can we control and what can we make the most money off of and how can we manipulate people and things? Because if, if you guys really thought that De uh, that criminalizing these things or making them illegal or harder to get would make a difference, alcohol and cigarettes would still be illegal. Yeah. So this isn't really about protecting people. Nope. Well, that's really kind of bums me out. So it's real, that's, that is just sort of really landing on me right now. So forgive me if I'm a little bit distracted now, cause I just go, oh my God, this is so interesting. So now, as a candidate, and I'm sure you got this too, I had a ton of people reach out to me about the decriminalization of marijuana in the state of Vermont. And I got a lot of um, emails and videos and things that are very much reminiscent of reefer madness and, you know, things like calling weed the devil's lettuce and stuff like that. And there are some of these people I really like as people. You know, so I don't mean to tease them and make fun of them as if they're dumb or anything, but I just don't, I just, it just seems like it's sort of hysterical thinking when you're not also trying to make alcohol illegal or anything like that. Like, how can you fight against marijuana as if it's the world's worst thing when so many more people are harmed by stuff that's legal? While drinking even. They'll, they'll, they'll be at the keyboard saying marijuana should stay illegal. They'll take a sip of their rum, you know? I mean, and it's not even, there's certainly a lot of conscious hypocrisy in our world, but this is, is, is very sublimated. This is very unconscious. Mm -hmm. They don't, it's that cognitive, cognitive dissonance it's of nice. alcohol is allowed by society and even praised by society. Therefore, I'm not going to go after that. But, you know, the devil's lettuce, that's a salad I would like, you know. Uh, you have marijuana and, and you call it weed, you call it dope, you call it, you know, all these, you know, unsavory things. It's again coming back to that rhetoric. It's again coming back to indoctrination and programming. And libertarians aren't necessarily saying, yeah, let's go do drugs. And that's one of the biggest myths we need oh my to God. tell is, is it's, we're not saying, yes, please go smoke. Please, yeah, yes, like, please, you know, inject whatever. It's <laughs> saying the government shouldn't be using violence to tell people not to do it. If, <gasps> if you as a person want to say, you know, you create some nonprofit dedicated to educating people to not do drugs, that's a perfectly libertarian uh sphere yeah it's perfectly within the libertarian sphere because you are then engaging in the free market of ideas you are then engaging in trying to you're not trying to use force to get someone to do something you're not you're trying not to mess government. with their consent. you're trying to get them to consent to your point of view through argumentation through logic through reason through compassion through empathy oh you know, oh, those you mean are being a human being. Yes. To other human beings. Yes. Being a human being. Yes. And, but and why, the Archie, when yeah. we can make the government force you to think the way that I want you to? You're not going to force the. You're not going to use force to get people to think. Sorry. What do you mean? I'm not going to get not the government going to, be able to, to force, force people force to think. To be able to get people to think the way you want. That's you can use government to make people change their actions, not their thoughts. That's what is so fascinating to me about some of this stuff that people don't understand is the only way that you can change a person's mind about whatever it is they believe is engaging in honest conversation and bringing it out to the light. Yes. That if, if somebody is a, is a, a racist, let's just say, or let, no, we'll stay on topic. If somebody's a drug addict, 
say, and I've worked with a lot of recovering addicts. I have worked with people uh, through the 12 steps, helping them get sober, helping them get back on their feet. I could yell at them all day not to be a heroin addict or a cocaine addict or an alcoholic or whatever it is. I can yell at them all day and tell them that they're wrong and that they're bad. I have not found that that is useful in helping people change their behavior. Absolutely. People want to, people need to understand why things aren't going the way that they want. People need to understand why they're suffering from the things that they're suffering from. People need to, you know, like, what, what person do you know has changed their behavior from you yelling at them? Other than myself? I try it with my husband all the time. It doesn't work. <laughs> Why won't you act right? No, I'm just kidding. In all seriousness, though, um, this idea that shutting down free debate uh, or shutting down or closing the door on ideas, even bad ones, that that somehow benefits society, I don't understand where that comes from. What world are people living in that that works? Well, not only that, but I, I think it's a fear-based thing. And the fear isn't necessarily of the other idea. The fear is that one's own ideas are inadequate. The people who most promote censorship tend to also be people that can't reason themselves out of a paper bag. You are, I'm, I have to agree with you, Archie. I really do. I think that what's really interesting about a lot of these arguments is that everyone just follows along with whatever anybody tells them, right? Like, oh, if you're a Christian, then you have to be anti-drug because, you know, whatever. Or if you're um, an anarchist, you have to be pro whatever because blah, blah, blah. As if we're not individuals with our own minds and our own experiences and things that we have to work through to decide for ourselves what we believe to be best for us and for our families. And it's like, why do you believe that you know better when you can't even argue with me about why I believe you can't even justify what you believe? Why should I do what you're telling me to do? Show yeah. me what's better for me and I'll consider it, but they can't. Yep. So, so what do you think about Oregon decriminalizing all drugs? Have you looked into I, I, I have not about? done any kind of deep dive into the laws they just passed. I have heard about this in passing. So I don't know specifics. I do think they've decriminalized all hard drugs. So one thing that comes to mind is how are they going to handle, I mean, if, if it's not against state law, are they going to cooperate or not cooperate with federal yes. enforcement? Because the feds certainly haven't decriminalized cocaine or meth or heroin, et cetera. Um, I think it's a good thing generally. I think it's going to be a spotlight on them for the next few years until other states do it. And I hope that they do it well, because if they don't, then anti-drug people, pro-drug war people are gonna you know, point and laugh at Oregon and say, well, we shouldn't emulate them. Well, and, and that's what it's, because here's the thing is, you know what, if you want to decriminalize it, fine. And you want to go down that, because I think Portugal did that too, right? Like we have some countries that have done it that we can look at their experience and see what we think. But more importantly, one of the things that's frustrating about places like Oregon or Vermont, when you're talking about decriminalizing, you're not just talking about decriminalizing, but you, but oftentimes they're also on the other end, um, I hate to use the word promoting it or condoning it, 
But when you start saying that, oh, well, then people can live on the street because being homeless is constitutional. You can live on public property in your sickness and your filth and and we're not going to prosecute you when you harm people because you're mentally ill or drug addicted, right? That's Sarah George, Vermont way of dealing with things. Yeah. Uh, safe injection sites. Oh, it's fine if you shoot up in our bathroom. You know, all of these things. What, I, what my concern is, okay, so we decriminalize things. We want to change our, you know, the, our relationship to this stuff. We want to restore some liberty, reduce government control. I'm for that. What I'm not for is all of the other nonsense that they go along with to try to make it easier for drug addicts to be drug addicts. Like, no, you're not going to have safe injection sites. No, you're not going to start putting needle boxes in all public restrooms so that I can be concerned about whether I'm walking in on somebody shooting dope. You know, no, you're not going to come into my place of business and force me to let you use my bathroom so you can shoot up there. You know, like that's what's happening in places like Seattle and Portland. And so you just go, no, dude, you know what? I'm not going to judge you and I'm going to, and I'm going to make a space for you to get help when you're ready. But that doesn't mean you get to encroach in my personal space and bring your addiction into my business, my home, my street, etc. So I'm going to make the analogy here because I, I, I will say that I'm strong on the ideas of why the war on drugs violates the war on the Bill of Rights. I am not yet as well versed on how a libertarian society can really deal with addiction and mm -hmm. And the associated, the associated social problems that come with it. Right. Other than high level stuff such as education. Um, voluntary efforts to help those people get off drugs, you know, that kind of thing. Those very broad stroke types of things. But what I will say is this, what it sounds like you're saying is you want the government to not only be neutral about drug use, but also drug addiction. And I can totally go with that because when the government was not neutral on the subject of race and it created Jim Crow laws, that carried huge effects societally. And then it went and got rid of those laws, but it didn't remain, it didn't go neutral. It went on the other side. And now we have things like affirmative action and so on. That's not true neutrality. Government should be neutral on all social issues and it should let the people deal with social issues and it should only get involved when someone commits an actual crime and or threatens to, e.g. drunk driving. That's one of the big things I think that people have a hard time with libertarian ideals or beliefs, ideology, is where does, so one of the things people will say as a libertarian is, you know, my rights, uh, your rights end where my nose begins. Yeah, a little bit, you know, past that. Right, but that that's the gist of the expression, right? So at what point can you recognize harm being done to other people? Like, I'm trying to think of a really good, I had a good example in my mind and it totally just went away. So if I'm a, that's one, but I think that's one of the big things people have a hard time or th that scares them about libertarian ideals, right? So if we decriminalize staying on topic, if we decriminalize drugs, um, what then do we do as a society to deal with drug addiction? Uh, well, I guess drug dealing wouldn't be, but you know, if we still have, cause you're, you know, the cartels aren't going to go away overnight. Um, like the marijuana thing, this has been my, this has been so stupid watching Vermont debate the whole decriminalization and marijuana uh, uh, marketplace has just been an absolute joke. Um, you know, 30% tax on weed is stupid. 
nobody is going to stop buying from their dealer down the street to go to Pearl Street Beverage and buy from the weed counter uh, 30% higher at a 30% higher fee, probably not even as good a weed as you can get. So like nobody, who's good? First of all, so you're not going to eliminate any of that stuff. You're still going to have people dealing drugs illegally or whatever, unless we decriminalize dealing drugs too. Do we decriminalize drug trafficking? Is there, is there any line at all for the government in the conversation about drug production and distribution? No. Oh, interesting. The so, only thing for drug production would be fraud. So for instance, okay. um, let's, let's take alcohol. Um, yeah. If uh, Anheuser-Busch decides to start, you know, uh, doping their alcohol with impurities, that would constitute fraud, and therefore okay. the government could step in. And that's a, so in the, now, now okay. that's assuming um, the the general idea that when a normal consumer goes to purchase alcohol, they're purchasing what they expect therein lies the possible fraud. So if, okay. if, if, if you go to purchase heroin on this new open market and they've doped it up with baking powder, I don't know what they do, but you know, let's yeah. just throw that out there. And if, if that's wrong, then I'm naive on drug things and that's okay with me. <laughs> um, but you know, hey, 50% uh, of my heroin is baking powder. This is not right. And, and right. the government could be like, yeah, you doped it with 50% baking powder to pad your profits and that's fraud and blah, blah, blah. And they have a case and now they own your company or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. It's that kind of line because- Because that's a different, but that's a, that's a different crime. That's an act yeah. crime that we've decided is an infringement on our rights and our liberties because you exactly. me, didn't tell me what I was getting. Right. Okay. Exactly. So I think we'll, I, you know what? I haven't been paying attention to how long we've been on here. We've been on quite a while. Hour yeah. I'm half, like, maybe. this went so fast. Um, I have so many things I want to talk about. We might, I might have to have you back, Archie. You and I do a little historical research and come back and have another conversation about this. But we'll, we'll start to wrap it up here because I think that you actually unintentionally highlighted something super important. And it was funny, I was listening to a conversation. What's that guy, honey, that you, the podcaster that you like to listen to? The, mm -hmm. No, no, the guy that's like from Iran or something. Oh, He's oh, Middle valuetainment. East. Valuetainment. Um, this guy, there's this podcast called Valuetainment. I don't remember what the guy's name is, but he interviewed Ron Paul. Patrick. Okay. Patrick something. So he, you know, Ron Paul is like the most famous libertarian in the United States. Um, he inspired a lot of us to start looking at libertarianism, liber liberty, ideals, fundamentals, foundational principles, etc. Love Ron Paul. And he was, so he was interviewing him and he goes, oh, you know, so Ron, if, you know, if they make weed legal, would you smoke it or something? And he was like, no. And he was like, why, you know, come on, why not, man? You know, blah, blah, blah. And Ron Paul was like, just because I think it should be legal and I don't think the government should interfere does not mean I'm going to run out and do it. Yeah, bingo. So I, it was really funny that you're like, you know, cutting it with baking soda and I, you know, I don't really know because there's this concept or there's this, this perception that any of us who believe that, oh, what happened to the camera? Your video just died, yeah. Um, oh, we don't have the continuous battery plugged in. So I'm just going to talk in on a blank screen here for a little, <laughs> but there's this idea and this concept that any of us who are libertarian or want to decriminalize drugs or whatever, that we must all be a bunch of junkies and yeah. you know, dope fiends, That's potheads. And, needs to die. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so you can cut that out in post-production. Oh, no, it's fine. I don't care. It's happened before. We Before, when I got started, all I had were my batteries, and I'd be by myself, so I'd have to run to the other side of the camera and replace the battery and come back. But normally, we have a continuous battery now that you can plug in for the camera. So it's fine. Anyway, so 
what do you think about this idea that all of us who believe that drugs should be decriminalized and that we should take a different route, that we're all just a bunch of dope fiends? That, that's definitely a myth that needs to die. It, it, Especially it since needs. you don't know how to cut heroin, Archie. I mean, really, what a right. bad I mean, drug user you are. <laughs> absolutely horrible. Yeah, I, I confess. <laughs> the thing about it is, for every possible freedom, there are an infinite number of choices. I mean, look at how many various religions there are, right? And yeah. to exercise, I, I call it freedom of conscience rather than freedom of religion because that's a little bit broader. And yeah. to exercise freedom of conscience, to advocate vehemently for exercising freedom of conscience doesn't mean I'm going to go out and be a particular religion. It doesn't mean I'm going to be, you know, Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or, or atheist or, or any particular religion. It means it's not my choice what you follow. That's all that means. Same with freedom of speech. Um, the Westboro Baptist Church, the super anti-gay um, church. I'll yep. defend their point of, of free speech. They absolutely have the freedom of speech to say what yep. they want to say. I will vehemently oppose the content of that speech. But, but I'll defend will, your right to say I, I will just as vehemently defend their right to freedom of speech. Same with drug use. I'll defend someone's right to, you know, shoot up heroin. Doesn't mean I'm going to go out and get a needle and shoot up heroin myself. And right. I think that it's, it's not just a myth about drugs. It's a myth about freedom in general that advocating for someone's freedom to do a thing also means advocating doing the thing. The thing. No, it does not. It doesn't. Period. All it advocates for, in reality, is that the choice isn't mine for their life. I totally wanted to say something else, but that is such a good point to end on. I'm just going to leave it at that, because that is ultimately what it comes down to. And I guess I'll just say, no matter how hard we try, and no matter how badly we want to you cannot legislate a man's heart absolutely it doesn't matter how many rules we put in place it doesn't matter how many laws we pass we cannot legislate a man's heart and so this idea that somehow we can control outcomes by controlling people is just foolish and we see it because human beings will figure out a way around that control no matter what it is Bingo. Thank you so, very much for having me on your podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to another such opportunity in the future. Yes! Thank you, Archie. Thank you so much for coming on again, everyone. Uh, I want to thank Archie Flower. He is the uh, Libertarian Party Chair for the state of Vermont. Archie, if people want to reach out to you and they want to learn more about the party or you and what you guys do, what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, our website, vtlp.org. VTLP, Vermont Libertarian Party. Yep. Okay. Dot org. Got it. Not net or com or anything else. And they can email me directly at chair at vtlp.org. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Archie, I'm looking forward to hearing more about the Libertarian Party in the future. I love what you're doing, getting people organized and motivated educating people. We need more people like you in the fight for our freedom and for our liberty. And uh, that's what it's all about. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, feel free to comment below. We're going to be, uh, we recorded this ahead of time because I'm going to be uh, unavailable for the live show, but comment. We're going to be reaching, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at your comments. We're going to be reaching out and uh, you know, writing back. So feel free to say anything that would be useful or interesting to add to the conversation, especially if you have any historical knowledge for the things that we both forgot about. Uh, but anyway, thank you again. Generally Irritable with Eric Reddick. Y'all have a good night.